There was a recent article on our work at, uh, in Physics Today, and uh, we had miraculously moved from Penn State to UPenn. So, <laughs> Fraser, don't feel bad. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is sort of our inspiration from the movie Fantastic Voyage, which came out way before most of you were born. Uh, but the point is that the human beings were shrunk down, uh, put in these little submarines, which go through blood vessels, uh, and uh, these are the red blood cells, these are the uh, white blood cells. And so that's kind of our inspiration, if you will. So what we are trying to do is, uh, the movie stops playing, but anyway, we're trying to make synthetic active matter uh, that uh, com communicate with each other uh, and do complex functions. And of course, these are systems driven out of equilibrium um, <coughs> by use of energy. And to do this, you need two components. Uh, first of all, you need something that can act on a given information and that can move. Uh, and you need, of course, the information to act on. And in this case, um, the information is in the form of chemical gradients or, or optical gradients uh, and so on. And the combination of the information and the information processor uh, will then lead to collective behavior, emergent behavior, what you, whatever you want to call it. So um, what I want to talk about are some potential applications. Uh, for example, motion-based targeting. Um, as I said, information processors, uh, how you can uh, create um, catalytic cascades, how can you create pumps, uh, sensors, uh, <coughs> and of course, how you can use these uh, to tween, uh, <coughs> tune rheology uh, of, of the medium. Uh, so all in 20 minutes, okay? All right, uh, here I go. <coughs> Uh, and of course, uh, there are interesting materials applications because these are dynamic systems. Uh, they can uh, optimize the performance by evolving their structures. They can work collectively. Uh, and since they're self-powered objects, uh, they're not tethered to any power source. They can move around and sense things and so on. <clears throat> So before I proceed, let me stress that you can, of course, move charged particles by an applied electric field or magnetic particles by a magnetic field. That is not what we're interested in. That is just um, lockstep behavior. What we're interested in are uh, particles, molecules uh, <clears throat> that harvest energy from the surroundings. They move independently, they process information independently. So they are independent of, of each other. And so since this is a molecular motors uh, meeting, uh, I will talk about something that is a molecule. Uh, and in this case, the molecules are uh, enzymes, which typically are five to 10 nanometers uh, in, uh, <coughs> in length, or size rather. So there are three things that I want to talk about. The first is that, and whatever I'm talking about enzymes is actually general for any catalyst. Uh, when they catalyze a reaction, they create enough mechanical impulse to cause their own movement, which manifests in um, enhanced diffusion. So here is an enzyme catalase, and as you increase the concentration of substrate hydrogen peroxide, uh, its uh, diffusion goes up. If you add an inhibitor, uh, it doesn't. And so it, it's directly proportional uh, to the reaction rate. Uh, and um, why they show enhanced diffusion, there's a lively debate uh, in the literature. I won't uh, go into it. Uh, but let me just say that if you do a back of the envelope calculation, uh, the impulsive force is about 10 to 15 piconewtons uh, per turnover. Um, I wish we can measure it. I, I know there are people here who can possibly measure this uh, force. Uh, so they're similar to motor proteins. 
and it suggests that uh, in evolution, maybe simple free swimming enzymes came before nature decided to put them on tracks and make motor proteins. So that's one property. The second property is that if you provide a gradient of substrate, then these catalysts will move up the gradient, i.e., they seek food. This is something that was chemotaxis, and this was thought to be something special to living systems, but it turns out these catalysts uh, will do that. Uh, so you can uh, demonstrate in many different ways. Here is just one way where you have a three inlet microchannel, you have the exact same concentration of enzyme in all three, and then you pass substrate through the middle or not. And if you do pass substrate through the middle, the enzymes from the flanking channel will move in and focus. And so you go from an equilibrium mixture of enzymes to a focused system. So it's a non-equilibrium uh, behavior. And it seems like this is actually quite uh, important uh, from a, a biological uh, standpoint. Uh, for example, it's known in biology that you have these enzyme cascades. Well, the first enzyme makes the product, which is the substrate for the second. Second enzyme makes the product, which is the substrate for the third, and so on. And what the biologists have found out is if you provide the substrate for the first enzyme, all the enzymes in the cascade come together. And this is called metabolome. There's a reason this is good, because that helps substrate channeling. The, the product is handed over to the next enzyme and the next enzyme. You don't lose it by diffusion into the bulk and so on and so forth. But the mechanistic question is, why do they come together? And they do come together. You can see these dots. These are these metabolomes where the enzymes in a cascade have come together. When the substrate is exhausted, they dis disperse again. So why do they come together? Well. <clears throat> Uh, our uh, hypothesis was very simple. It's just chemotaxis. The first enzyme makes the food for the second. So the second goes towards the first, because that's the source of its food. The second makes the food for the third. So the third goes to the second. And so everything collects. And when the food is exhausted, they disperse. And you can show that by, for example, uh, taking the first four enzymes of a glycolysis cascade uh, and you can label the first and the fourth enzyme. Again, a three-channel, micro-channel. You can put the first two in the, this one, third and fourth in this one, past D-glucose, which is the substrate for the first enzyme. <coughs> and so the hexokinase moves in directly. This has to wait till its food is produced. And then this, then this. So there's a time lag between the first enzyme chemotaxing and the fourth enzyme chemotaxing. And you can see this clearly. This is hexokinase. Uh, this is aldolase. And so this is, this is an example of collective assembly at the molecular level. And one talks about how information arises from energy uh, our chemical gradients, for example, we are obviously not uh, random peptides with random sequences of amino acids. And the question is, how do these sequences ar arise? You know, what, how does the energy lead to information? And I think chemotaxis is one possible mechanism for this. Because if I have 1,000 proteins, and if I put the substrate for one of them, if it's an enzyme, only those that are linked by a catalytic cascade will come together, and they will come together in a time-dependent manner. <clears throat> so I think this is one way of directing molecules. Uh, you can do separations. Uh, for example, if I have proteins that are exactly the same size, same charge, how do you separate them? Well, if they're enzymes, I can. Uh, I will put the substrate to the top channel, a mixture of the enzymes to the bottom, only the active enzyme or the most active enzyme will move up and go out of this. So you can do separations. <coughs> OK, uh, so the enzymes move around when they're working. 
what do they do to passive particles, inactive particles? Um, and the answer is their diffusion goes up also. And I won't walk you through the experiments, but we've looked at different passive particles in solutions of enzymes, and the enzyme is catalyzing a reaction. And again, this might be quite important. Uh, there have been several papers, this is just one of them, which showed that uh, in bacteria, uh, if you shut down all the enzymes, they go into a glassy state. And in fact, it is the enzymatic action and not just the motor proteins. It's the enzymatic action that fluidizes uh, the cytoplasm. <clears throat> so we think this is because of the kind of things that we've been observing. Uh, <clears throat> you can go to bigger um, things. You can go to uh, liposomes and polymerizomes. You can enclose enzymes in it. You can control their activity uh, by controlling the size of the aperture. You can shut them. You can open them. You can move them by chemotaxis, as I just said. Um, you can load them up so they can deliver a payload. Uh, so positive chemotaxis of the type, of what I just told you, have been reported after uh, our publication. This one is, is what I think is fairly remarkable, where because your brain has more glucose than your blood, you can make one of these things with glucose oxidase in it, whose substrate is glucose. And then this guy will go across the blood-brain barrier by chemotaxis. And, and we've now uh, also seen that you can not only move towards, but away, depending on how you engineer the system. So you can program, uh, program these things. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you can use them uh, for um, treatment. So, for example, this is just one example. Uh, bladder cancer, there's a lot of urea in the bladder. And so here your motor is urease. Okay, so you, you, you make particles uh, uh, with, uh, with urease as your engine, if you will, and they will move around as long as you have urea present. And what uh, this paper shows is that they, uh, these active particles can penetrate these cancer cells much more efficiently than any inactive particle. <clears throat> and so, so this is, and, and they have another examples uh, that have been shown uh, where you can do this. <clears throat> Um, so enzymes show enhanced diffusion when they're catalyzing a reaction. They um, chemotax. If you nail these suckers down so that they can't move, then the mechanical force is transmitted to the fluid. They act as nanopumps or micropumps. Very simple. You just take the enzyme, attach it to any surface. Um, you can put in tracer particles so you know where uh, the fluid is moving, you add food, substrate, uh, and depending on the enzyme, oops, depending on the enzyme, um, you have flow. Okay, that's very useful. I've been pressing random bu buttons here. Okay. Um, depending on the enzyme, um, the, the fluid will move out or move in. Uh, and here's just one example. Uh, in this case, uh, the fluid is moving in towards the gold patch. Um, and again, just like the enhanced diffusion of the enzyme, it is tied to the reaction rate. Faster the reaction, higher uh, is the pumping rate. And <clears throat> so, uh, and of course, when the substrate is exhausted, pumping stops but you can add fresh substrate and you can recover the pumping. <clears throat> um, so there are a number of applications. These are basically sensors compounds because they only pump fluid 
when they sense a, their own biomarker or their own uh, substrate. Um, so you can do all kinds of things. You can do active on-demand uh, drug delivery, where, uh, for example, what we showed is you can take a gel and you can hydrogel fill it up with insulin, uh, and you can attach glucose oxidase to them, the gel. If you put it in glucose solution, it will pump, and it will pump out the insulin. But remember, it depends on the amount of glucose present because the reaction rate is tied to the substrate concentration. So more glucose you have in the surrounding, more insulin will get pumped out. So it's an on-demand um, uh, delivery. Um, you can use them as sensors for toxic substances. I won't talk about it. Um, the other thing is, in terms of sensors, you know, it, the, the trend is to miniaturize sensors, go from microsensors to nanosensors and so on. The problem is that if you have a nanosensor and you're trying to sense something, the analyte, the rate determining step is the analyte finding the damn sensor. Uh, and if it's a big particle, like a virus particle, it could take days if the sensor is small. But if you house the sensor in one of these things, then these things will pull in the fluid so it beats diffusion. Uh, by the way, these, these pumps are really versatile. Um, and I'll show you the extreme example of this, which is um, uh, and Defense Threat Reduction Agency has made all these mutant enzymes that work on nerve agents. And so we told them how to make a pump. So you can pump using Soman, which is a nerve agent, nasty nerve agent. And so these guys are pulling in the nerve agent, hydrolyzing them, neutralizing them actively. Okay. Uh, Finally, um, these flows can be used to sculpt sheets. And so we are doing molecular level reactions, but that causes micron level or mesoscale chemically driven flow. That in turn causes macro scale uh, directed motion. And so you can have these, I guess they are working slowly. Uh, you can have sheets, and depending on how and where you put the enzymes, you can have them go make different kinds of shapes. Um, and so you get different response depending on where the enzyme is, uh, and so on. <coughs> uh, so I think. Uh, I showed you that you can make these synthetic objects. Um, enzymes are, of course, not synthetic. Uh, but we work on different length scales, uh, and with, uh, which, which can move using chemical energy and using uh, chemical information or optical inf gradients. Uh, you, you start to see uh, rich collective behavior you can turn these around and make pumps out of these things. And so to go back to this, um, so the chemotaxis allows particles to um, sample a large region of fluid through power diffusive motion. And the chemotaxis allows you to do non-random sequential assemblies, uh, which in turn leads to catalytic cascades, uh, which can accelerate reactions and so on. I told you about analyte-triggered pumping, which couples chemical sensing with microfluidic pumping, allows cargo delivery at specific locations. Um, <coughs> you can make micro or nano sensors um, and that are much more sensitive because you can pull in the fluid. Uh, and as I said, you can tune the rheology of, of the fluid by the presence of active uh, particles. So this is our dream. Uh, actually, blood has a lot of fuel, glucose. And you'd use glucose oxidase engines for this. Um, this is where we are. 
Uh, the computer mice, mouse, of course, has evolved quite a bit from 1968. Um, so give us 20 years um, and see with how close we get to this. But my point is there are lots of possibilities with nano and micron size powered systems. And so think ambitiously and don't sell yourself short. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so open for questions, please. Wow. People are getting very sleepy. I think. <laughs> okay. Yes. Behind you. Oh. Me again. Um, the pumping effect in the enzymes, there are clear potentially mechanical ways that could be happening. What happens in more general heterogeneous catalysis? So, yes, so, so you see diffusion, enhanced diffusion, chemotaxis, pumping, all of these uh, in all kinds of catalysis. We have seen them with uh, pl platinum particles. Um, there have been papers using titanium dioxide, which are photocatalysts, and they actively move towards organic substrates that they photooxidize. Um, and, 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 and you can make pumps um, you know, that will pump across membranes using these kinds of architectures. Um, so yes, um, there's nothing special about enzymes. Um, uh, I think it's a very general phenomenon. Steve? Hey, um, a strange question maybe. At the moment you're adding the substrate and the systems move in mm -hmm, response. Mm -hmm. If you had a system where you could oscillate the concentration of the substrate, for instance, a protected glucose that you could reveal using yeah. photochemistry, yeah. you could then have a time dependence uh, component to all of this. Yes, yes. Can you uh, comment on what you anticipate seeing in that situation? We're trying to build one, actually. Okay. Um, uh, there, are, there, there, are, there are two things you can do. One is you can put, put different enzymes in series in a pump architecture, and you can get vectorial flows. The other thing you can do is you can have a slow enzyme and a fast enzyme, and you can, you can build a clock in principle. This was first proposed by Dan Koshland as a, as a model for bacterial chemotaxis. Um, and so we're trying to do that. Um, Yes, these guys don't have temporal memory, and I would love to build that into. So your your point is well taken. Yeah. 